You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ask Drone You. My name is as always, starts with P, ends with an L, kind of sounds like politics. <laughs> Let's not. Agreed. And I'm Rob, and uh, happy to be sitting here in this chair, hanging out with you guys. Thank you for spending a few minutes of your day with us. We appreciate it very, very much. Definitely. And if you would take a second to leave us a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you listen to the show, please, please just leave us a quick review. We, we would really greatly appreciate that. Today's show is really going to be focused on answering a question about when you're having trouble uh, flying a particular aircraft due to interference, uh, is a cellularly operated drone the way to go? Or is maybe kind of working back to basics and seeing if you can create a better environment uh, to fly? So a uh, very interesting kind of question uh, for today, yeah. Rob. Yeah, I would imagine there's a lot of people that actually have this uh, issue if they're flying in similar uh, situations, which I'm sure a lot of people are. So hopefully this is uh, going to be able to help a lot of you. Yeah, hopefully it will. If you have a question, don't forget, go to askdroneu.com. And whether you're augmenting your business with the drone or you're trying to start a business with a drone, or maybe you're just trying to be a better pilot, don't forget to check out the Drone U community, right? It's the only one with three dozen deep dive classes. That's the biggest online library of drone classes on the internet. But also we have a community that's now in application form. We literally built our own social media platform. That way your data won't be used against you. Anyway, on that bombshell, which there, uh, as one review put it, there are no bombshells and uh, I would respectfully agree. So <laughs> anyway, so that's- uh, Stop saying bombshell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After reading that review, I'm just like, okay. Uh, but anyway, hey, you know Wait, what? Was that the last bombshell? I'm not sure. No, probably not. N n who, who knows? You know why I say that? No, I don't actually. It's because I grew up uh, watching uh, a lot of Top Gear. And it's uh, it's what, uh, what's his name? Oh gosh, don't forget his name while you're recording the show. Crazy Brit. Uh, Jeremy Clarkson. Mm. It's pretty much how he ended every show. And uh, I like it. I was like it, it a bombshell when he actually said bombshell? No. Mm -mm. Oh. Nope, nope. Maybe it was to some Brits back then, but definitely not now. So, but anyway, let's get into today's question, uh, which is brought to you by, we've got some trainings, actually some in-person trainings. Actually, I'm very excited to see many of you as I love in-person training uh, just as much as all of you do. Good news though, we are going to be adding actually kind of a new format of trainings. This is something that we were working on pre-pandemic, but we're just going to go ahead and uh, go for it. So we haven't scheduled these trainings yet. They're probably going to come online here for August uh, and we're going to kind of go where the weather takes us, literally. Uh, so we're going to focus on offering our core trainings, right? Our mapping classes, our flight mastery classes, our operations classes. But we're going to also offer additional classes on top of that. So we're going to make this more of an experience mission-based training. Uh, the reason I'm telling you is because I'm looking for a little bit of feedback from you and feedback uh, from those of you in the group. But long and the short of it is, is we're actually going to set up, and we've already been doing this, uh, setting up to work with local business owners to essentially give you kind of like a, uh, um, what was the name of that show uh, that Trump used to do? Uh, the Apprentice, where it's kind of like where you're tasked to produce media, to produce drone jobs, but you're trained on how to do it first and then you go do it and then you're given feedback on it. So it's kind of like the ultimate feedback loop, the ultimate training, right? It's not just exercises, but exercises, missions, and then kind of going through those missions, going through how to deliver that data and so much more. So these experience-based uh, trainings will have different bends. Some of them will be creative, some some of them will be technical, and some of them will be both. We have an exciting new partner to announce uh, that we're working with on these trainings, and I just hope to see all of you at these trainings because, you know, Rob, oftentimes people say all the time how much fun that they have at these trainings and how they love uh, the mission aspect of it, especially the fly-in, how the fly-in is nothing but missions, you know? Well, we're kind of taking the fly-in and... 
uh, kind of going mobile with it. So uh, very excited. I know Rob's like, why are you talking about this right now? Because um, I'm excited about it. Uh, we haven't gotten it on the site yet, but just want to let all of you know they're coming. So it's going to be fun. I think it's going to be a blast. Hello, Drone You. I am Arturo from Bogota, Colombia. Uh, I have to do some work with the local government here. I need to go down as low as 20 or 30 meters. Since this is a pretty crowded city, we have lots of interference and Wi-Fi connections. So I keep losing signal at 200 or 300 meters, no matter if I am on 2.4 or 5.8 gigahertz. So do you think it's better to try to switch to internet connection like 4G LTE? If you think that is the case, what is the best way to do this or the best model that I could acquire for a price similar to the Phantom 4 Pro B2? So thank you, and that's it. Thank you, Arturo. Super cool to be hearing from you all the way from Colombia. We appreciate you listening so much. And uh, if Arturo could ask a question all the way from Colombia... From Bogota. You can ask a question from wherever you are. So anyways, we want to hear from you as well. Ask DroneU.com. But let's jump into an answer for Arturo. I think you've got a couple of thoughts for him that I think will help him. Yeah, in, in pre-show, you know, we kind of discussed that in order to best uh, help Arturo, which is a very cool name, by the way, um, that maybe it's best that because we don't know all the information that, yeah. hey, you know what, let's just let's circle back here and really make sure that uh, he's setting himself up in the best position because maybe maybe he's he's uh, not doing everything that he could and that may allow him uh, to have success rather than purchasing a brand new platform. So right. the way that I kind of want to take this question on is, okay, well, let's talk about solutions before we try to go buy more equipment. Um, what can we do to potentially make the situation better? How do, what does that look like? And then we can talk about there are certain flight controllers that allow uh, cellular connectivity, although I'm not sure that this would solve his problem. And then lastly, I want to bring up uh, one more idea that might work well for him, uh, which is all about utilizing autonomous flight plans. But anyway, Rob, as you know, when you want to fly a drone far away, what's a good rule of thumb for the drone pilot? Uh, I do not have any clue where you're going. You, well, keep it in line of sight. I, that, mean, I uh, mean, yeah, that's definitely... got to be able to see it. That's basic, right? You got to okay. be able to see the drone. <laughs> and, you know, so, uh, some of us might be privy to military school. Most of us aren't, including myself. Uh, but what I heard from a friend of a friend of a friend is that they teach you uh, that it's always good to be at a uh, high elevation Gotcha, uh, gotcha. In the position gotcha. of yeah, an that's what you're going for of an attack, right? Well, we want to do the same thing when we're flying drones. We want to make sure that Arturo is at a very high point that he's on top of a building, he's on top of a hill where he can see the drones, he's on top of a parking structure. There are kind of caveats to to flying from parking structures, uh, which we've had shows. Uh, and we've talked primarily about don't take off from parking structures. Right. But there is something that you can do uh, to negate those problems. I, well, I'm pretty sure we've talked about that. But if we haven't, case, landing pad, take off. Okay, cool. Anyway, uh, so Rob made a very good point. Visual line of sight. You got to keep a visual line of sight. And in order to have the best VLOS that you can, what you want to do is stay up high. The higher you are, the better the connection. Okay. Another thing that we want to do, though, is it's important to kind of understand the capabilities of our aircraft uh, and uh, have a basic understanding of radiometry, right? At 5.8 gigahertz, that signal is is literally created to be able to travel further uh, than 2.4. 2.4 was really made for shorter distances, much more data. Uh, so 5.8 should give him what he needs in order to be uh, successful to have a decent operating distance, right? Right. So, okay, so how could he, what is, if we were to have a succinct step-by-step -step kind of bullet point list of what he could do to uh, ensure that this is really an interference problem and not a human error problem uh, is one, take off and land from a high point, right? You want to really make sure that if your drone is only flying 20 to 30 feet above buildings, you need to be at pretty much eye level with that aircraft, Two, we want to make sure that we're controlling off of 5.8 gigahertz. Three, we want to make sure that our antennas are facing the correct direction. Um, you can actually tell so much about a drone pilot's knowledge based off of how they put their antennas 
you know, do you remember the joke I made a very long time ago when we were looking at Balloon Fiesta for the fly-in and there was that advertisement of a, I wouldn't call him a competitor, but there's a gentleman teaching young kids. Mm -hmm. Like that's his primary focus, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember what I said when we passed that, that poster? Because the Balloon Fiesta administrator mentioned, he's like, that's the second or third time that you've said that about that poster. But this guy had a remote in his hand and he's like teaching kids and his antennas are crossed. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was just like, well, there you go. You can tell right there is knowledge because his, his antennas are crossed. So you don't, never want to do that. Uh, and any, my point is, is that the, uh, his name was Paul as well, gave me a hard time for picking on people and how their antennas are. <laughs> and I was like, well, the devil's in the details, right? You've been told that growing up, right? And yeah, right. And I'm like, well, I try to pay attention to the details and that's something that I noticed. So make sure you've got your antennas pointed out. Why do we do this? Because again, imagine this pen is my antenna. The signal does not come out from the tip of the antenna. It comes out from the facade of the antenna. So you want to make sure that those are facing the right way. Another thing is maybe your antennas are damaged. This has happened to a couple of my friends. Um, if uh, your case is a little tight and you kind of jam your remote in there, it's easy to break these antennas. So I would, I would, you know, take one of them off, make sure your connections are still solid. In addition, notice how many pilots in the FPV community still change out the antennas on the DJI FPV unit, hmm. right? I've never changed mine out because I get significant distance, like very, very good distance. Hmm. I have no need to make it better. But I also notice a lot of FPV guys still change up their antennas. Um, I really wonder if that is a factor of the environment or a true necessity of antennas. Because with FPV, you know, everyone's used to kind of the old analog stuff and they're used to buying antennas. Anyway, long story short is a patch antenna might be a good solution for you to increase your controllability distance in these difficult environments. It's important to understand though, with the patch antenna though, that is a very directional antenna and you've got to pretty much be uh, I mean, literally pointed right at the drone with the antenna. You remember the tacos we used to talk about all the time? I do remember the tacos. <laughs> so that's another option for them. I mean, that's very true. Cheap, low grade option to try to increase the uh, distance. Now, what the tacos do to your signal is kind of take this wide signal and narrow your beam, which means you've got to be pointed right at the drone uh, as well. Um, but if you're at a higher position and the can, the antennas are good, um, you're on 5.8, uh, you are visual line of sight with the drone, i.e. there are not obstructions blocking the signal to the drone. At that point, if you are still having issues before, again, before you go out and buy a drone, what I would do is it sounds like this particular deliverable that he has for the government is a pretty clear cut and dry deliverable mm -hmm. or a pretty clear understanding of a flight plan, right? Because you notice how he he, he kind of uh, eludes to he's got to cover a lot of ground. Right. He's flying really low. He's got to get some detail. Why not just fly an autonomous pattern and then walk with the drone to maintain visual line of sight? Which, by the way, he is in Columbia, and we don't know that he has to maintain visual line of sight. Well, okay. But from uh, a standpoint okay. of good connectivity, <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. That's the point. Yes. So I just don't want a review telling us they're talking about Columbia, <laughs> right? And there are no drone rules in Columbia. We don't know if they, well, we there yeah, are, they, they have their own set of drone rules, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Thank you, Rob, for, uh, always pleasing the, yes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> anyway, would drive you crazy. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's okay. We're all human. I need to grow. So that said, uh, um, <laughs> That's so funny. But you're so right. Yes, we're not speaking regulatorily. We're <laughs> speaking uh, about the uh, mm. necessary means of operating these aircraft and the general rules in of the, doing in so. In the most effective way. Yes. Correct. Yes. Which is really funny because I've actually like never put those two together, right? FAA here in America, you're on a visual line of sight, right? Why? Well, because the remote needs visual line of sight, guys. You got to be able to control the thing. Anyway, 
Okay, I digress. Uh, and you're probably bored at this point. Uh, so what I was saying is if he can fly an autonomous flight line, yeah. I would walk with the drone to, to maintain a better signal with it. If he is really flying that low, it should be easy uh, to stay with it. And then if he does need to go to a cellular drone, there are flight controllers that do allow for a cellular connection. I'm pretty sure here in the United States, the options to buy are limited, though, that you if I understand even with the one particular drone I'm thinking of, that you've got to essentially like work with the manufacturer to turn on that feature. Hmm. And uh, I mean, the first drone that kind of comes to mind is the the Autel series of drones. Uh, because they use the Cube flight controller. Any flight controller that uses the Cube uh, is GSM enabled, meaning it's cellularly enabled. You can control it uh, from a cellular connection. Um, but if he's seeing that much interference, I'm not sure that that would solve the it's problem. He might want to, and here is another option, right? I know you say you have to fly super low. Well, if you think about Wi-Fi, especially uh, home-based Wi-Fi, you really have a dome of effective range, right? Because after that effective range, um, as Jason would say, uh, the distance at which the Wi-Fi can travel is uh, it's a negative to the inverse as far as the further that you go out. I think that's just Jason's way of saying I know how to use big words, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, buddy. Uh, but anyway, I tell that to his face if you guys were wondering. So, uh, But anyway, that's because I have a good relationship with him. My point is, is that if you fly higher, uh, and you can utilize a different drone with a different focal length, um, you might not need to fly so low. And if you don't need to fly so low, you could really inhibit a lot of the potential interference. So here's what I'm saying, right? You fly with an Inspire 2 hmm. X7 50 millimeter camera, you know, your field of view goes from this to this. And right. you might be able to fly at 100 feet with the same essential uh, you know, photos as you would with, say, you know, a Phantom flying at 25 or 30 feet. Hmm. For a lot more money, though. Yeah, it would be a lot more money. But I mean, as soon as you go into cellular tech, you're talking five figures minimum. Oh, so you're, yeah. Yeah. So, and Big also, money. I know that the drones that I, I, I was going to recommend, Autel, which I always hesitate with Autel because they still haven't added an attitude mode or an essentially an emergency mode where you have full control of the drone in case something happens. But Autel does make very easy to pick up and learn drones. Like if you're used to flying DJI, it's easy and simple to move to Autel. They do use the Cube. I'm not really sure which of their aircraft, though, you would be allowed to access the cellular uh, capacity. Hmm. So Interesting. Lots of options. Yeah, there hopefully are some solutions in there for you, Arturo, because uh, that can be frustrating when you're trying to get a job done and you continue to lose connectivity and just a pain in the butt. If it were me, I would be looking for parking garages. I would be going to the top of parking garages, put my drone on top of my case that has a landing pad on top of that, take off from there, you know, cover the effective distance, find another parking garage. Yeah. Um, I also would probably get a patch antenna if he's really facing the issues that he's having, but he might really solve a lot of the issues if he can fly a drone a little bit higher with a more zoomed in lens to mm -hmm. get the right look that he needs. And then he might not have as many interference issues. But I love these kind of job specific questions, Rob. I really yeah. do. Yeah. Because it's it's easy to understand the basic kind of rules of of how these drones operate. But when you get into this myriad of, of operating environments, the issues you face are different. The, the solutions that you face are different. You often have to be a true entrepreneur, which is mixing a lot of different skill sets together and kind of putting it all into one uh, solution. And uh, I, I think it's fun and creative to kind of solve these problems. So I like them. Absolutely. So keep them coming. In other words, we love to hear from you. Ask DroneU.com like Arturo and we will do our best to get your question answered. Yeah. Thanks again for listening. Like we yeah. really do appreciate it. I love one of those recent reviews too, Rob, where they're saying, you know what? I learned so much more from your asides than I do some of the main content. I love that <laughs> review. I'm just saying. So please leave us a review. We do read them. We do care. Uh, and we do know. Uh, yeah. Please leave an honest you know thoughtful review we would greatly appreciate it so that's gonna do it for us today no bombshell my name is paul <laughs> my name's rob <laughs> on that bombshell <laughs> that'll do it <laughs>